She is the paid or director of paid media at Axel 8, which is a local boutique digital marketing agency that I actually used to work at. So she is a freaking pro, you guys, when it comes to running any sort of um, paid advertising on social media, mainly today what we're going to be talking about is Facebook and Instagram. So thank you so much for coming. Um, please, as we go through, um, you know, put questions in the chat and we will be monitoring that and getting those over to Rachel. And then after she's done presenting as well, we're going to open it up and we can discuss. Um, I know I will have a ton of questions to ask and yeah. So uh, before we jump into the actual content with Rachel, we do have a few sponsors that have, you know, partnered with Nova to put this on landmark title and also old Republic home protection. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Wendy and Tara so they can give a little spiel before we jump right in. Sure. Good morning, everyone. We are Old Republic Home Warranty. So uh, thank you all for being on the call. As uh, COVID continues to keep a lot of us at home, um, Facebook and Instagram becomes more valuable to all of us. So um, and not only that, everyone that's working from home are using their systems and appliances a lot more right now. So please, 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 anyone you talk to, talk to them about home warranties because nobody wants to spend any additional money that they don't need to. So anyone can get a home warranty. We will be putting our information in the, in the chat. This is the back page of our brochure and we can get you PDF copies of that if you would like. And also we'll put in the uh, chat our, um, our Facebook and our Instagram stuff so you can uh, connect with us. We would love to connect with all of you. So if you have any home warranty questions whatsoever, please chat with me. Um, I'll be around all day. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Tara. Um, Patty, Michael, do you guys want to chime in real quick from Landmark? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Patty Carabio and Michael's right over here as well. Uh, we just want to say thank you so much for attending today's uh, class. You're going to learn so much and I'm just uh, so excited how much value we've been bringing um, every month in Mastermind. Once this COVID is over, it's definitely going to be different. We're going to have it in a nice venue, a little happy hour, a little appetizers and some door prizes. So I can't wait till that time. But for now, just stick with us on um, joining us every month for Mastermind. We're always uh, coming up with some great ideas to bring value to you and to help you grow your business. Um, with COVID and everything, we just want you guys to know that we're here. We're working every day and we are open for appointments through Zoom. Um, if you don't mind um, coffee with a mask, we, don't, we respect where you're at. So we just want you guys to know that we're here. Um, also, we have some great marketing tools too that we can help you as right now with um, digital marketing right now is so popular. So just know that Michael and I are here uh, to help you create any type of digital marketing and it's free. And it's not co-branded, it's just with your information. So it looks like you're creating it, you're making it, and you're posting every day, just letting your clients know that you're here, you're working, and the market is hot, and that you're available to show them properties and to sell their home. So um, we are, um, I've been doing this for 20 plus years, love what I do. The favorite part of my job is that I get to build a wonderful business relationship with you and I'm part of your team and I help you and I support you, help you grow your business. Michael, do you want to say anything? No, you, you nailed it. Um, I'm super excited to have a big turnout class today and I myself have been wanting to learn Facebook ads. So uh, pretty stoked for everyone here. And like Patty said, we're, we're all here for your marketing needs and we would love for you to write us on our next, next escrow. So that's basically it. Thank you. <clears throat> Awesome. Thank you, you guys. I absolutely love Michael and Patty. They're the best. All right. Before, right before we get into stuff, just want to give you guys a quick background on who I am. And then also um, Jason Smith, who is the loan officer that I work with at Nova. He's on as well. So um, real quick, I'm Tiana. If you don't know who I am, I'm the um, business development coordinator out of our Nova Scottsdale branch. And 
What I do is use my marketing knowledge that I've acquired the past six years in my last jobs and I help realtors build their business with it from anywhere between video marketing, um, social media consulting, um, ads. I, you know, ads are a huge thing that I do, not only with um, our branch at Nova, but also realtors that I work with. So um, I am sort of the marketing guru over at our branch, and um, I absolutely love meeting new realtors and working one-on-one -on -one with them to help them build their business. So that is me. I would love to absolutely meet you guys. Um, I That's like my number one thing I love to do, coffee, lunch, come in the office, hang out for a little bit, and get to know you a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Jason real quick so he can give his little two cents, and then we'll go ahead and have Rachel take the mic. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, a lot of familiar faces on here. Patty and Michael, I want to say, are fantastic. I worked with them at their previous title company. Um, and now when they went to Landmark, <clears throat> I was a little like, who the hell is Landmark? I don't work with them that much. And uh, now they get the bulk of my business. I probably send 30 or 40 refinances a month to them. And they are fantastic, them and their team. I just can't express that. That's been a lot of my success this year. Um, a lot of familiar faces on here. I see Acela. Tara, go 10th planet. She knows what I'm talking about. We do jujitsu together. So, uh, but anyways, guys, I've, uh, you know, I'm one of the top 200 producing LOs and I'm also vice president here. Um, and one of the top 200 in the country, but I'm also the vice president here at Nova Home Loans. And if you guys need my help, or if you have files that are going sideways with your current lender, reach out to me. I'll, I'll earn your business through doing the hard work that most people want. And then when you'll want to send me all your other files afterwards. So it's pretty much it, but great to see everybody. Tara, I'll see you tomorrow night at Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> hey, Tiana and Jason, just want to endorse Jason. Oh my God. Jason is a great lender. You guys, seriously, if you guys are looking for somebody that is just, um, you know, returns phone calls and is on top of things, I really highly recommend Jason. He's very good and uh, we enjoy working with Jason and Tiana. They're just amazing team and we're super excited to start off with Landmark, partnering up with both of them. And it's just been a really great, um, you know, just journey with you guys. So thank you. Thank you for all that you guys do. All the feedback that we get from our agents that are using you guys is nothing but the best. So great job, Jason. You're doing good and we just appreciate right. you so much. Appreciate Thanks, it. Tiana, as well. <clears throat> ah, you guys are so sweet. I can't. <laughs> Love you, T. Thanks so much, Jason. Love you back, homie. Um, all right, let's freaking get into this, you guys. So um, my my girl, Rachel, like I said, we used to work together um, at a local digital marketing agency called Axel 8. She's still there. She just got promoted to the d director of paid media. She been, she's been doing paid um, advertising on social media all kinds of different platforms for years and she is a total expert so wanted to have her come on and share her knowledge with us because she has a ton of it um this is sort of a like 101 class so for people who maybe have never run ads before or have maybe dabbled in a little bit so um she's going to walk us through her presentation and give us her two cents on paid ads so Without further ado, this is Rachel, and um, go ahead and pull up your presentation, girl. All right, perfect. Let me share my screen really quick. All right, so like Tiana said, I'm Rachel. I've been doing paid media for about seven years, actually. Um, my, I would say probably my favorite channel is Facebook ads um, and Instagram ads. So I wanted to kind of tailor this presentation to be more about kind of what you should be thinking about from the strategy side and less of the tactical side. I do have a quick video that I put together um, that Tiana will send after that actually shows the tactical how-to, um, but I feel like the real knowledge that I wanna share is what you should be doing um, and less so on like how to actually go in and the buttons to press. Uh, also, you'll hear me mostly just talk about Facebook ads. It's both, they're one in the same. Instagram ads are set up through the Facebook ad platform. Uh, so just know anything I talk about here can be applied to Instagram ads as well. Also, I much prefer a more like casual approach uh, to presenting. So feel free to interrupt with questions, throw questions in the chat. Uh, this isn't a super long presentation because I definitely wanted to make sure that there was time for questions at the end. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions that you might have and I'll be happy to answer them. All right, I'm going to jump right into it. 
Okay. So if you saw Tiana's um, Instagram story, you know, I have maybe my three main things that I like to talk about when setting up a Facebook campaign. And the first one is making sure that you're reaching the right users. So knowing who your audience is before you go in there, having an idea of who you want to target can make it a lot easier and a lot less daunting when you actually get into the platform. So a few tips on kind of understanding who your audience is. Mm, let's click through. There we go. Uh, so finding your audience. This is probably the, the biggest step to, before you launch your campaigns. Um, this is where, you know, a lot of research can come into play. Luckily, um, when it comes to real estate, almost anyone could be involved um, or interested in that. So it is a little bit maybe easier to approach that. Um, but there are some great tools within Facebook to help you discover that as well. So one is um, that I'm a huge, huge proponent of is using your existing customer information. So you can actually upload emails um, to Facebook directly and create what's called a special ad audience that allows Facebook to kind of find users that are similar to your existing customers. So it's essentially letting Facebook do a lot of that research work for you. You don't have to think about, you know, what their interests might be or anything like that. You just upload that, you set your location, and it will help find new customers for you. Like I said, I'm a huge proponent of this because it's super easy and very effective usually. And then the other side of that is the interest-based targeting. So if you've dabbled in Facebook ads, you know about this and you've, most of you have probably heard about this. Facebook has a huge list of interest-based targeting that you can use. Um, so you can you know, target people that are interested in real estate and interested in interior design and things like that. And one of my big recommendations there is to try a lot of different combinations and try unique combinations because with that, you can really tailor your ad messaging to their specific interests, which makes them more likely to click, more likely to convert, more likely to feel that connection to you um, so that they're more likely to turn into a customer in the long run. Yeah, and I'm gonna, real quick, Rachel, I'm gonna chime in real quick yeah. here. Um, so as far as targeting people based on interest, you guys, on Facebook, so just wanna give a little bit of um, a case study that I have done. So um, I've been running Facebook ads with Jason's team, and as some of you know, he's a veteran. And so he wanted to run our first Facebook ad that we did. He wanted to run an ad targeting veterans. So. What I did was I went into Facebook and you can find um, your that particular audience based on their interests and their interests could include the army, the Navy, um, you know, the different branches of the military so that if they have interacted with pages that have those sort of, you know, interests, then we can find those people with the ad. So as far as like interests go, there's so many different things you can do. And so you just need to figure out like who you want to talk to and then find those people either through different interests or by uploading a list into Facebook. That's actually a great example. I also put together just like a quick overview of what I'm kind of talking about. Um, this is a lot more generic than Tiana's example, but just so you can get an idea. So say I set my location targeting for Phoenix. Um, and then you can add interest targeting around real estate investing and then narrow that by people who are also interested in interior design, for example. And then you could create messaging that speaks to more of the investment properties you might have or um, properties that have really great design potential, especially I know in the Phoenix area that I'm in, there's a lot of like historic houses that do need the work, but they would be so great for someone who knows interior designer is you know, interested in that. Um, so this is just kind of an example, same with Tiana's, of how you can use different interest combinations to really tailor messaging, um, especially for specific properties. Now, there are some things that you can't do in Facebook um, because they do require, um, they have certain policies for housing ads. So when you create your campaign, you will have to mark that you are in a special ad category uh, for housing specifically. And it's all just around non-discriminatory processes. Um, so within that, you can't target most demographic targeting, such as age and gender. You also can't target based off of zip code, but you still can target locations. It's just based more off of a radius. So you would put in like a full city or a neighborhood, and then it would set like a 10 mile radius around that. So you can still target the locations you want. You just can't be zip code specific. 
Um, and then there are some limitations around the interests that you can target. So for a non-special ad category, you can target like behaviors and household income. That's not available for housing, uh, but there still are some highly relevant ones. I called out a few notables here, uh, such as real estate investing, FHA, FHA loans, house hunting, and a lot of things like that. Um, and I know Tiana mentioned like the veteran side. So there's definitely a lot of relevance. Um, it's just a matter of kind of going in and searching what's available. And if you have an idea of kind of what you want to target, type it in, see what comes up and try it out is my biggest recommendation. Try things, test things, iterate off of what works. All right. And then, so once you feel like you have your audiences set and you've kind of created those, the next step is engaging them. So just reaching them isn't enough. You have to create ads that will make them stop scrolling and want to click on your ad and want to provide their information or do whatever action that you want them to do. So with that, you have to create your messaging. And the biggest thing here is making sure that you stay true to your brand. So if you have you know, a specific brand that you use on your Instagram page, don't change that for your ads. Keep consistency across your website, your print collateral, your ads. If you like to use a casual tone, don't try to be super technical and professional in your ads because it just won't, it might not resonate with the same types of customers that you typically go after. And then also I've touched on this a little bit already, but know your persona. So while you can't necessarily target users based off of demographics, you can tailor ads towards those um, kind of indirectly. So for example, if you typically focus on people who are retirees or looking for a second or third home, you can mention that in your ad copy. Or the other side, if you typically go after first time home buyers, you can mention that in your ad copy. So while you can't target you know, the age specifically, you can still mention it in your copy and use your creative to kind of present that. And then you'll attract more of that demographic and that persona. Um, so while the limitations are there around the actual targeting, there are ways to indirectly kind of encourage the people that you're going after to interact with your ad. That way you're not getting leads from people that you don't think that you're more likely to close. And I just want to add one thing on this, and this may be jumping forward a little bit, but okay. just so you guys know, um, once you create your ad, you're not stuck with it. So let's say you're run, you, you know, you set your ad live and you have specific messaging and maybe like two weeks in, you're still not seeing any action. You can go back into your ad and change something in it to see if you get better results. So maybe you change, you know, the description text, or maybe you change the headline that's in there, or maybe you change the picture. You can change, you can tweak little things to see if, you know, it makes a difference in your results. You're not, you don't, you're not stuck with whatever you decide on from the very beginning. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, iterating off of your ads is definitely really important and testing different messaging, different imagery. Um, if you're going to use story ads, testing those out, testing different placements, there's just so many different things that you can change and you are by no means stuck into pretty much anything that you put in your campaign. All of it is um, changeable and you can, as you learn more, you can kind of make those iterations. All right, another thing to consider with engaging leads is that post-click experience. So if you engage them from the ad and then they click it, you want to make sure that the experience after they click your ad makes sense and is, isn't confusing and is straightforward. So one of the big things is to make sure you have a clear and defined call to action that's based around your goals. So throughout this presentation, I'm really gonna focus on like lead gen um, because I think that's probably what most of you will be focused on. Um, but if you're looking to capture users' information, then make sure that your call to action speaks to that. There are some limitations around that in terms of the actual button on the ads. They only have a few options, um, but after they click, make sure it's clear that that's what you want from them. Um, if you're sending people to your website, make sure there's a form fill that they can fill out. Or if you're using the native lead form, just make sure that you're capturing that information and make sure that the messaging in the ad also speaks to that so you have a consistent path. So don't have an ad that basically calls for their information and asks 
for their information so you can follow up and then land them on yeah, an about us page because that it has a mismatch and that wouldn't make sense and they're more likely to what's called bounce which means they'll click your ad see the page and then immediately leave without actually reading it or performing any action and then along those same lines you just want to make sure that you're creating a good experience overall um, a big tip when it comes to a landing page if that is what you choose to use is to keep the content on the page short, simple, and easy to read. Um, I believe that the industry recommendation is um, like a sixth, sixth grade reading level um, because you wanna make sure it's very, very easy to digest. Uh, you also just wanna make it look nice. You wanna make sure you're considering the mobile side of things and the desktop side of things. Um, make sure that the imagery is clear and you know easy to read, not blurry, not too big not too much text, there's just kind of, think about what you interact with most and what you enjoy seeing if you click on an ad and just kind of try to duplicate that. Um, because I think the biggest mistake that can be made here is overthinking it and trying to add too much information. Uh, so just keep it simple um, and make sure that it's just clear with exactly what you want them to do on the page. So I also have a little backstory to add to this. So um, in regards to the veteran ad that we had run from, for Jason's team um, a while back, I, I had actually created a, a landing page specifically for the ad. And so basically what it was, was we you know had the ad that would pop up in their newsfeed. They would click on the learn more button. And then once they hit the learn more button, they would be directed to the landing page that I created. And on the landing page was another video, a form that they could fill out, and then a bunch of information on basically what NOVA can offer and why the Mortgage Masters are, you know, one of the best teams in Arizona. And after, after running it for about a week or two, we would see people click on the learn more button and go to the landing page and then they wouldn't do anything. So like Rachel said, they would bounce and we wouldn't capture their information. And so we were like, okay, like why is nobody doing anything? And we kind of came to the the discovery that after they already digest the ad like they're ready to act right then and there they don't want to go to another page and digest even more information because then you're going to lose them at that point point. and so like she was saying facebook has a native lead form which basically is as soon as they click that learn more button or that you know sign up now button or whatever it is whatever your call to action button is it pulls up a form right away so that they can Put their information in right then and there yeah that's actually a perfect segue um so i kind of touched on landing pages and lead form and tiana obviously also just touched on it uh, so a landing page would be a page that like lives on your website or on a subdomain um, that users would leave facebook to go or instagram to go visit um, so there's a lot of great reasons that you would want to use a landing page you have a lot more control over what it looks like um, you can you know kind of do whatever call to action you want you can send people directly to a property page if that makes the most sense for the ad uh, but the one thing to consider with the landing page is you would also need to set up a conversion pixel uh, so i have a article later um, for reference on kind of how to create those and how to add them to your site but you would want that so that you can actually track what users are doing once they hit your page um, so that is kind of the caveat to using a landing page, but there are benefits because you do have more control over it. Then the other side, and something that I definitely recommend is the native lead form. So like Tiana mentioned, this lives um, directly in Facebook. So they don't actually leave Facebook um, when they click on your ad, it pops up just a quick form. You can add in any questions that you want. So name, email, phone number, estimated budget, pretty much anything. Um, and then they fill that out. Some of it is automatically filled out from their Facebook profile and they click submit and then they're back on Facebook. So it is a really nice and really simple to use experience for the customer. Plus all of your leads actually live in Facebook. So it's really nice because you don't have to worry about you know, connecting a CRM or anything like that. It's, you can just go into Facebook and download your leads whenever, whenever you want, whenever you need to. Um, I believe you can also set up automation automatically download an email um, leads to you on a recurring basis. So I did add in a little example of what those look like right here. So just a little screen recording. Um, so like I mentioned, it kind of pops up. This is a GIF, so it'll refresh and show you kind of what it looks like as a whole. Um, but 
someone would click your ad and it would pop up and there would be questions. This is for a car company, but it still gives you an idea of like the types of questions that you can ask. You can even add in a calendar um, like this shows. This is one of the native features on it so that they can put in a good time and day for you to follow up. It has their information and then they would swipe to submit and then done and they're back on Facebook. So like I said, it is a really, really great um, kind of experience for the user because you're not taking them away from the scrolling and the engaging that they're doing on Facebook or Instagram, um, but they can still give you your information. All right, so once you have your audience and you know what you wanna do after they click your ad, um, the big thing of course is deciding on a budget. Uh, so this can feel kind of overwhelming. Um, technically you could spend almost infinite dollars on Facebook. Facebook would 100% let you do that. They would gladly take your money. Um, so it can feel like you have to put a lot of budget into Facebook to make it work, but that really just isn't true. I've worked with clients who have spent $500 a month on Facebook and we've still been able to drive plenty of success. I would say um, as a general rule of thumb, I wouldn't go below like five to $10 per day. Um, I do have some campaigns for clients that do only spend about $5 a day. Uh, that is probably the absolute lowest I would go, um, but you can always play around and see what works for that. But a few tips on kind of deciding on what your budget should be. Sorry, my thing is not working, there we go. Uh, so the big thing is know your goals ahead of time uh, so that you can really measure success properly. Um, so a big thing that I push for is knowing your customer value, uh, because if you don't understand the value of an end customer, then you really won't know if the amount you're spending is profitable, if it makes sense. Um, you won't know if you know a specific audience is working. Should you spend more? Should you spend less? You just It's really important to kind of know what that end value is for a customer. Uh, so that you kind of can work backwards from there, which is my second <laughs> tip, is working backwards. So if you know that you want to get a certain number of new customers a month and you kind of know how many leads you typically close, um, you can kind of use that to work backwards and set goals for your campaign so that you can measure that. So I did put together a little example of what that might look like with just some pretty much made up numbers. Um, so Assuming that an average customer value is about $5,000 and you want to get about two new customers a month and you typically convert about 2% of leads, that would mean that you need about 100 leads in that month to reach that new customer goal. So there's kind of two things you can do here. If you have an idea of what, what you want your budget to be, you can plug in what your budget is. So here I use the example of $1,000 a month and then you would have kind of your target cost per lead, which is $10. Um, and then that would make it really easy to measure the success of the campaign. Or if you're not sure what you want your budget to be, but you have an idea of like how much you're willing to spend per lead, you could plug that in and then work the other way. Uh, so this is just kind of a really good way of thinking about where you want your budget. But again, nothing is set in stone. And that's probably one of the biggest takeaways. If you take nothing else away from today, just know that nothing is set in stone and iterating off of what is working and what isn't working is really important. If you are spending $20 a day and you don't feel like you're getting the leads from that and you want to lower it, do that and see what happens and then iterate. If it works, continue doing it. If it doesn't, change it again. Um, don't feel like anything you do has to stay on for too long, which I actually think is what I mentioned next. Um, so I'm actually going to skip to the bottom one because it ties in nicely. Don't waste your time if it's not working. Um, there is definitely ramp up time for things. It does take time for a campaign to really start serving and for you to start understanding how it's performing. But I would say that's no more than two weeks. After two weeks, if you're seeing, if you're not seeing good performance, then you can shift your focus, whether you're seeing a low click through rate then maybe you need to look at your ads and change your ads out. If you're seeing a high click-through rate and no conversions, then maybe your post-click experience needs to change, similar to what Tiana was saying with the veterans landing page. Um, and if you just feel like you're seeing nothing, then you might need to look at your audiences and maybe change those around. Um, there's just a lot of different iterations that you can make, um, and that's why it's really important to not 
not don't try to make something work if it's not working just change it and continue changing until you find what works best and also i think it's really important to track your lead quality so facebook doesn't have they don't know what the quality of these leads are they just know that they're coming in so one thing that can happen is you can start getting a bunch of leads from one audience but they could be low quality and maybe you're not converting any of them um, but Facebook might start favoring that audience because they're seeing all these leads come in. So sometimes you have to go in and kind of tell Facebook in a way that like, hey, this isn't great, whether that's changing up the audience or lowering the budget to it, um, because Facebook will start to favor um, audiences or ad sets that bring in high volume of leads. Um, and I've definitely experienced in the past where the lead quality isn't right. It's just not quite right. And Facebook is favoring it more and more. So it's kind of exacerbating the issue. Um, so by tracking lead quality, you can kind of help prevent that. And then also, you know, what is working. So if you're seeing that the leads from a different audience convert at a way higher rate than typical, then you can put more budget towards that. And you can open up that audience maybe and add more ads and try new things in that one. So it is really important to understand how those leads look and if they're good. Because one thing to note with the um, lead form is because it does autofill on Facebook, there is like a review screen after someone um, submits their information. So they're supposed to look, make sure that their information looks good. Uh, but of course, not everyone makes sure to check that. And because a lot of people signed up for Facebook when they were in college or high school, um, their email address might be a little old. So don't get discouraged if you're seeing email addresses that are old or that bounce back. That is bound to happen um, just because of the nature of the autofill. I would like to add a little something to this. Guys, I can't um, express enough the importance of tracking um, the results of your ads. Um, I can tell you just from our, our latest ad that we're running right now is actually on down payment assistance. and we have gotten an immense amount of leads. Like I would say in the last two weeks, we've had more than 40 leads come in. And so the caveat is like, are these leads gonna convert? And so obviously after we're done running the campaign, we're gonna be working these leads and seeing you know, what happens with them. And so I would highly encourage you guys to do the same thing. So keep track, you know, have a spreadsheet of all the people that came in through your ad, have the, you know, the actual look like whatever ad you ran so you know exactly what you sent to them all the leads you got from them and then keep track of them like see which ones converted over the last few months and then kind of go from there yeah that's great and i know that uh, a, a sales cycle can be kind of long so in maybe that first month you're getting leads and you're not sure what the quality is until a month or 90 days later um, so just keeping track of that and going back and iterating off of that. Um, typically, what we say is like the two week to one month range is when you want to just make sure that you're bringing in leads. And then from there is when you start looking at the lead quality and changing if you're seeing quality issues. All right, so I have a few tips on building your first campaign, just things that I personally um, like to set up. Uh, just from my experience, um, it's not going to get super in the weeds. Like I said, I did I did make a video uh, that Tiana will share after that actually shows the step by step process of actually creating your campaign. Um, but I wanted to provide just a couple tips that I have. So the first one is the objective. So this is one of the first things you'll see when you create your campaign. It'll ask you to choose a campaign objective. So make sure that you're choosing one that matches your goals. Um, so if you are using the lead gen form, so the native lead form, make sure you select lead generation. Um, this is the only one that will work with the form. And then if you're sending people to a landing page um, where you want to uh, convert them, then you would select conversions. And this one would require a conversion event through the Facebook pixel. And then one thing I also wanted to touch on is if you're just trying to raise awareness and just want to get your name and face and company out there, I would actually avoid this section around awareness um, because the brand awareness and the reach um, objectives focus a lot on impressions and just the number of eyeballs that you're getting on your ads. And while that can be a good thing, um, sometimes impressions aren't as valuable as Facebook tries to make them seem. So I would actually recommend either using traffic or engagement. So traffic will measure 
and focus on how many people are actually clicking your ad and going to your website. And then engagement would focus on how many people are commenting, sharing, reacting, um, things like that. So it's a little bit more of like a hard um, kind of objective that you can actually focus on and optimize towards, whereas brand awareness and reach is just eyeballs on ads. And technically an impression on Facebook means that the ad is 25% um, on the screen. So an impression can count even if your ad isn't fully on the screen. Um, so that's why I tend to avoid those. Next one, um, I recommend starting out at least with campaign budget optimization. So this allows Facebook to kind of decide where your budget goes between your different ad sets, which is how your audiences should be broken up. Um, I like starting with this. Sometimes I will move away from it depending on kind of what I'm seeing. Uh, so a big thing that can happen is if you're seeing an audience provide um, low quality leads and Facebook is really favoring that, then I would recommend switching this off and adjusting the budgets at the ad set level. Um, but it is best to start with this so that you can kind of get a jump start and let Facebook sort of decide. I also recommend using daily budgets. Um, Facebook also offers lifetime budgets. I only recommend lifetime budgets if you're running like a special. So like someone running like a Black Friday deal that is planning on running their campaign for only eight days, then a lifetime budget makes sense. Um, but if you're kind of running it ongoing, then I definitely recommend a daily budget and then just setting it for whatever it breaks out to at the month. Hey Rachel, we had a question that came in. Yeah. Um, they said, would traffic and engagement be where you would put an ad for a listing? Um, yeah, so I think that would probably make the most sense. I would probably recommend traffic. Um, that way you're getting more eyes on the actual listing page. Uh, depending on what the page is like, um, you might be able to use conversions, but remember you'd have to just have an actual action that they can take. So maybe you have a listing and then at the bottom you have like a little form fill for them to provide their information because they're interested in that listing. Um, you could use conversions, but I think traffic would probably be great if you're just trying to get more eyes on it. Sweet. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, and then it, when you're setting up your campaign, you have the option to select where your ads are showing across Facebook's whole um, kind of marketplace, which is a bad word because marketplace is a real thing, but um, across all their different placements. Um, so I typically recommend excluding Messenger and Marketplace placements. So Messenger, I've just seen not perform as well. Um, I've also read a lot of articles about kind of how people feel about ads in Messenger and they feel like they're intrusive um, because it's kind of private. Uh, so in that sense, I recommend it because you don't want to be, you know, annoying or feel intrusive to these people. And then Marketplace, because you're not promoting a product, it can be kind of difficult. I know people put like rentals and things in marketplace like apartments for rent, uh, but it can be kind of harder to compete in that area as well. Um, so I would recommend sticking to feed stories and then um, an article is great. So this is like if you're on, if you click into BuzzFeed, you'll see ads within that. Um, and those ads are actually through Facebook. Uh, so those are great. And then in stream is just uh, video ads. Uh, but it can also show static image ads as well. So really just excluding Messenger and Marketplace, and then other than that, you should be good. So when you're creating your audience, there will be kind of this little dial on the side that'll show you the estimated audience size and kind of your audience definition. I recommend always aiming for uh, in the green. Um, so anything lower might not serve because it's too specific. Anything higher might be a little too broad. It's not a huge deal if you're on this side, if you put in your audience and you really, really want to try it out and it's over here, I wouldn't say don't do it, um, but just a general rule of thumb is kind of aim for this defined audience section. Um, and then also I've touched on this, but make sure you're segmenting your audiences by similarities so that you can tailor the ad messaging um, to what their interests are. So don't don't put veterans and interior design interests together uh, because they wouldn't interact with the same type of ad. And then when you're creating your ads, there'll be um, this kind of little widget on the side that will let you 
look at all ad previews um, across all different placements. Um, so this is really important to check just to make sure that the image that you're using doesn't get cut off if you have, you know, like text overlay on it. Um, just make sure that it kind of reads the way you want it to read. I definitely recommend just quickly going through and checking uh, to make sure that you like the way your ad looks across all placements. And then I also recommend launching with at least three ads per ad set. Uh, you can definitely do more. I'd say maybe three to six is the, is the sweet spot. Um, this just allows Facebook's algorithm to work a little bit better for you. Um, if you only do one ad, you can't you know, compare different messaging and different creative. Uh, so three is a great place to start. Hey, Rach, real quick, can yeah. you, yeah, I was, I was just going to say the same thing, Debbie. Um, can, you ex can you explain what an ad set is and yeah. what it means to upload three different ads per ad set? Yeah, absolutely. So the general structure for a Facebook campaign is kind of threefold. So there's the campaign level, and that's like where you set your budget. And then there's the ad sets, and that's where you create your audiences. Um, so if you, for example, want to do a existing customer, a special ad audience, an interior design one, and a veteran one, um, since those are the three examples we've used, each one of those different audiences would be its own ad set. And then within each ad set, you would want at least three ads. So for the veteran one, you would want three ads that speak to veterans. And then for the interior design one, three ads that speak to interior designers. Um, so that's kind of the hierarchy of how like a Facebook campaign would look. And basically what that's doing is it's giving Facebook more, like can you kind of explain like what having three different ones, like how that's beneficial? Yeah, so Facebook uses this super secret basically algorithm um, to decide which user is most likely to interact with which ad. So if you have three ads, since the users within each audience, while they have similarities, they have different behaviors. So if you have three ads that are varied in their messaging and they're creative, uh, still within the same interests, Facebook will say for user one, they're most likely to click on ad two, but for user five, they're mo most likely to click on ad one. So I'm gonna serve those ads to those users. So if you only have one ad, Facebook can't do that for you. Um, so everybody's just getting the same ad and Facebook can't kind of help to determine which messaging makes the most sense for which user. Does that help answer that? Yes, and we had a few more questions come up. Mm -hmm. um, one is, does it cost more to run with the three different ads per ad set? No, so your budget is set entirely at the campaign level. You can put technically as many ads as you want. There's, I think, a limit of like 250, but that would be ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but you don't pay more for ads. Um, you pay, it's on a cost per thousand impression technically. So you're paying every time uh, someone sees your ad. But if you have 10 ads in there, you're paying the same amount as if you have three. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, we got one more. Just to clarify, you're recommending one set example towards veterans of three ads, not three different ad sets, each with three ads for a total of nine ads. So actually the second one is correct. Um, so you would have nine ads total. So three ads per ad set. Um, it is possible that some of those ads are the same across ad sets. So something that I typically do is I'll have like one evergreen I call it or generic ad that's you know very brand focused and still has that call to action um, that can be used across any audience and isn't necessarily interest specific. And then I'll have you know one or two uh, more specific to the audience. So it's call it like seven to nine ads if you were to have three ad sets, but each ad set would have three ads. I have a quick question for you guys. Um, I'm Caitlin. Um, I just thought about this on the fly, so sorry I didn't type it out. Um, when, when, when a client or a customer works with either you, Tiana, or with Axel 8, um, is the expectation that the client, like if it's their first time ever doing something like this, is the expectation that you like the customer either drafts up content or language that they would like to be called out and you guys and we submit it to either of you and you guys refine it to help us if someone is an expert in doing these type of ads in terms of like i know facebook you can't say you and you can't use specific words so like um or are you heavily relying on your client customer to draft up the perfect sets of content for all your ads and your ad sets so 
For what we do at Axley, um, we write all of our ad copy for our clients. We'll take, if they have like a brand guide or something like that, or if they have specific language that they want to make sure is included, we'll try to include that. But I want to touch on something that is actually important that you called out. Um, Facebook does have ad policies around calling out like specific features, essentially. So kind of the way that what people think about it is how you said it, um, Caitlin, is you can't really say you. Um, so you can't say things like, are you, you know, 25 and looking for a house? Like you can't do that. Um, so you have to do, you do have to keep it a little bit more um, generic. Uh, so in my ad example, um, this is just something I made really quick for the screenshot. This would potentially actually get disapproved because I do say this might be the answer for you, but this could also get approved. Um, it's Sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, they've been a little bit more lenient with language like this lately. Um, it used to be like straight up, if you said you, it was gonna get disapproved. Uh, but since this doesn't specifically say, you know, a characteristic of the person, it's more likely to get approved. But that is a great point that you brought up actually. Yeah, and Katie, just to um, kind of explain how I've been doing ads. Um, so for at like Nova and Jason's team, um, I usually just like powwow with the team. I'm like, hey guys, like, what do you want? What should we run an ad on this month? And they give me their ideas. And then I kind of just take it and run with it. Um, I usually, and Rachel, this is something I want you to touch on too. I usually make a video for the ads that we run because video seems to perform better. And so, um, yeah, we, I basically will put together the content for the ads and then push them live. Um, we have a marketing team that supports, um, running ads. And so luckily I have that kind of cushion to rely on, um, as far as actually executing the ads and running them. Um, for any realtors that are interested in running ads, um, I, I do work with um, realtors and helping them to create uh, the content for their ads and help them to um, get their ads running as well. I actually work with, there's a team that I've been working with and we've been running quite a few ads and I've been putting the content together for them and they'll send me the listing link and kind of just give me the, the lowdown on what they're looking for and then I'll create the, the content and, you know, in some cases create like a video of the listing and stuff like that to run as the ad. Um, and I'm sure to Rachel, um, you would be available to helping some of these realtors get their ads together too. And then, like she said, she works at Axel 8. They're, you know, a full service marketing agency that I'm sure would be able to take on new realtor business as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm glad that you touched on video. So I agree, video does tend to perform. Uh, Facebook favors video over static imagery for sure uh, because they find it more engaging. Um, so if you have the uh, ability to create video or if you're working with either Tiana or an agency like Axel 8, um, video is definitely something that I would recommend. Uh, but if you're trying to do this yourself and you don't have the capabilities to create video, you can still see success with static. Uh, but there are a lot of great tools out there uh, that you can create simple videos. So I use Canva. I'm sure I know Tiana has talked about Canva. Um, you can create very, very simple animated, basically you add a static image and you add an animated text overlay and Facebook sees that as a video. So you don't have to create, you know, like a big commercial production thing, um, just something that has some movement, Facebook will favor in the same way. Uh, so there's a lot of really approachable ways of getting to video or even GIF works well. Hey, Katie, real quick, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Um, I, I definitely have worked with, um, you know, like a act like type of company before. And sometimes like depending on the scope of work, like it's always um, hard to clarify, like at what point do, do like the, do either you or the ad agency jump in to help clarify on the language and the ones that I've worked with, it's almost like I end up doing almost the entire copy or the contents. I was like curious how other people operate or if that's just like a one-off because, you know, as everyone knows, like the ads itself are expensive. The time it takes mm -hmm. to put in the content and copy is lots of time. So, mm -hmm. you know, for other reasons I've used it, it almost seems like we would rather have like spend the extra money for an ad agency to do like the full service versus yeah. me having to go back and forth with different drafts and versions. So yeah, that, that clarifies it a lot. 
Okay, perfect. Yeah, good. And uh, just as like a general tip, if you're working with an agency, they should, if they're full service, they should definitely be creating those ads for you and providing those. Obviously, if you want to provide information to them, they'll gladly take it. But um, a, a typically, an agency would at least provide a lot of recommendation and the final product. Um, so if you, if any of you do decide to work with an agency, I just make sure that that's part of your contract with them because that is one of the most time consuming parts of this, um, especially when you get into ad testing, um, creating iterations can take, it's almost a full time uh, job potentially, depending on how large the account is. So I would just provide that out there if you do decide to work with an agency, it's definitely important to make sure that they're creating the copy and create it for you. Perfect. Okay, we have another question, Rach, real quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how long does the does the ad run for? Also, when you said Facebook favors ad sets, what does that mean about to my ads? So an ad will run as long as you leave it up. Um, you can set an end date when you create the campaign, uh, but if you're planning on just kind of running it ongoing, I wouldn't suggest doing that. Um, so as long as the ad is active and approved, it will run and there's no reason for it to stop. And then, um, so Facebook will favor, what I mean by it will favor ad sets is um, if they think that the audience that you created in one of the ad sets is most likely to convert, then they will push more budget towards that and provide more impressions to that audience. Um, again, it just goes back to their algorithm, which like I said, it's very secret, so I don't know exactly how it works, but I do know that it does. Um, so they will, in that sense, they will favor it. And then on the video side, like I mentioned, they, um, if you have three ads in an ad set and two are video and one is static, you'll likely see a lot more impressions go to the two video ads over the static one because Facebook knows that users engage with video more. Rachel, I have mm -hmm. one more question. <clears throat> Can yeah. you, does, cost per click go towards your budget? Like, can you talk about that? So say like I set my budget to $1,000, essentially is my cost per click um, bit getting split up between the three different ads in one set? So like if one's outperforming the other two, like you said, more budget goes to that one. If, if whatever the industry average is, like hopefully we're all hitting that, and maybe you can go into mm -hmm. what the real estate industry average is, because I know there's different um, industry categories that you fall into, but if my three ads for real estate are going towards industry average, essentially once I have, once that $1,000 is used up, my campaign ends, correct? Like it doesn't go on forever. It can't be active forever. You continuously have to put more budget into it. But if I took a month off, it's not live. So if you don't set an end date and if you use daily budget, it would continue running unless you um, like had an outstanding balance, then they would pause your ads. Um, but technically it could run indefinitely if you set a daily budget instead of a lifetime budget. Uh, and then the cost per click. So typically you're paying um, on a cost per thousand impression. So the cost per click is essentially calculated based off of how many clicks you're getting. Uh, so one ad set could have a cost per click of a dollar and one could have a cost per click of $2. That doesn't necessarily mean that the $2 cost per click is performing worse because if more of those clicks are converting, then you should be willing to accept kind of the higher cost per click because they're a better quality click. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, can you explain like is cost per click different than cost per, did you say thousand impression? Like is, are those two separate like objectives? Yeah. So cost per thousand impression is CPM. Um, so you can see that in there. And um, so that's kind of what you're paying off of in a sense. And when I say that you're paying off of that, it's just um, that's when Facebook chooses to charge you. So like when you launch a campaign, you'll, you'll potentially see that you spent maybe like $5 and you haven't gotten any clicks. That's because you're paying for those impressions. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're only charged once you hit a thousand impressions. Um, Facebook basically calculates. So let's say you hit a hundred impressions and you're charged $5, it would calculate out what your CPM is based off of that. Um, so you're essentially being charged per impression in a way. And then cost per click is completely separate. I typically focus a little bit less on CPM and more on cost per click, click through rate and actual lead volume. 
uh, because that is you know where the main KPIs that your main goals lie. Um, so if your CPM feels high but your cost per click feels really strong and you're seeing a really strong click through rate, then I wouldn't worry about your CPM. Uh, so they are separate in that sense, uh, but it all kind of works together uh, to create um, a, either a successful or a non-successful campaign. Um, Tiana, do you happen to know what the running industry average is for real estate? Like, is that its own category or yeah, business? I, I don't, I don't actually, um, but that's something that we can look into and we can send after the class for sure. I okay. actually have um, a link to an industry benchmarking report that has real estate in it. Uh, oh, so perfect. when Tiana sends this, it'll include that. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. Awesome. Great. I actually think, okay, so this, um, like I said, Tiana will share this after, but this is a quick video with literally the step-by-step -step of what button to press to create your campaign so that you have that. Um, it's fairly straightforward, but there are some kind of things that you might see that you don't, that don't make sense or whatever. So feel free to reference this when you're going through in case you get stuck. It's about five minutes long, so it's um, pretty quick. And then these are the additional resources that I mentioned. So the first one is just additional information around the policies for housing. Uh, this is directly from Facebook. I really touched on most of it. It's nothing that you have to really be worried about. It's not like you can do anything that Facebook won't allow you to do, but it is if you feel like you're not able to do something, I would check this and see if it's just something that you're not allowed to do. Uh, the industry averages and benchmarks for Facebook ads. This has all industries in it, but it does call out real estate specifically for click through rate, cost per click, uh, CPM, and I think a few others. And then uh, the last one is how to create and install a Facebook pixel for your website. So if you do choose to send traffic to your website instead of the lead gen form, this is a great um, overview of how to do that. Uh, also, I'm sure Tiana or myself could help um, with that as well, uh, but it is very, it's fairly straightforward to do. And that's it. Um, so I think there were a few things in chat, um, but if there are any other questions, uh, we do still have a few minutes. So happy to answer those. Rach, thank you so, so much. Um, I think this has been our best class so far. This has been awesome. <laughs> um, you are just a wealth of information. Um, guys, do you have any questions for her? Um, feel free to drop any in the chat. It looks like we got, thank you so much. Thanks for another great mastermind. Thank you so much for this class. Thank you. Great information. Thank you very much. Looks like it was a hit. Um, <laughs> so I do have one question. Um, can you tell us what the difference is between a boosted post and an actual ad? Great question. Yeah. So I personally don't love boosted posts. Um, they, they've gotten a little bit better over the years that I've been doing Facebook ads, but essentially um, if you post something on Instagram or on Facebook and you just want to reach a broader audience, you could boost that post. The nice thing about boosted posts is you don't technically have to like go into the Facebook business manager, Facebook ads manager to do that. And you can just throw a small budget behind it um, and you get a few more eyes on it. Uh, but you have a lot less control over um, like, a landing page. If you don't have a, a click through on the post, then you can't add one to the ad. And I don't recommend necessarily promoting ads that don't have some sort of click through. Um, so there's definitely a place for them. If you are just trying to get more eyes on a specific post, I do think it's fine to do a quick boosted post. Um, I wouldn't run it for any longer than a week though. Um, and like I said, you can typically get away with a smaller budget for those. Uh, so if you're running it for a week, you could throw like 20 bucks at it uh, just to get more eyes on it. But an actual ad is where you, you know, you're creating the ad, you're setting a landing page and you're targeting the audience. Boosted posts have a little less uh, targeting capabilities, I believe. Um, so I definitely would lean towards creating ads, even if you do have like a, a property you wanna promote and you've posted it organically on your Instagram and you want to promote it through ads, I would even recommend creating an ad separately and not just boosting the post um, because boosted posts kind of, they, like I said, they run out, um, they kind of hit their max a lot faster than ads. Um, so I would lean towards ads. I could not agree more. Okay, <laughs> so it looks like we have another question. Um, can you tell us how much you recommend on spending on ads or boosted posts? Maybe just like a baseline for real estate. Yeah, um, it's a little bit hard to give that, but I would say that a really great starting point is maybe that like 300 to 500 range. Um, 
I am a big proponent of starting a little bit lower and expanding from there. Um, I know there are some agencies out there that will recommend starting high, um, but I just know that's not realistic for most people. And also when you're trying to learn what's working and what isn't working, I do think it's better to go a little bit lower um, than maybe, maybe you have a number that you're comfortable with, go a hundred dollars lower than that and then expand into that um, as you start seeing success. But um, I definitely would say that like $300 range is probably a good starting point. Awesome. That sounds good. All right, I, guys. Any I, have, I have one more question um, <laughs> here again. So you were like, this whole thing was so awesome. Thank you both for putting a lot of time and energy into this. You kind of really went over Facebook and explained it really well. I have a question. You said you favor Facebook a little bit more over IG. Can you explain like, is it just that like the performance metrics or the reach or the impressions? Like what is it about IG that maybe isn't becoming as successful or Facebook or are they like pretty even like what, why would you, if someone only had a budget to maybe do one or another, like why would Facebook be chosen over IG? Um, so I don't necessarily favor Facebook over Instagram. I do think though that Instagram, for it to be successful, it's a lot more about the imagery, um, the way that an ad shows up, you really have to capture them with the image, whereas Facebook, you do have that copy. Um, but I, if someone felt that they only had budget for one or the other, I actually wouldn't even recommend doing that. I would say to allow it to run in both and you can actually go in and you can see which one performs. Um, and then if you feel like your budget is spread too thin between both of them, I would choose based off of where you're getting the most engagement early on. Um, so say that you create a campaign and you have it running in both Facebook and Instagram. After you know 10 days, go in and look which one has a stronger click-through rate. Um, and then you can put all your budget towards that one. Um, it really just depends. I've seen some clients where Instagram performs really well for them. And I've seen some where Instagram doesn't perform at all and we end up shutting it off. Um, I will say one thing with Instagram is more people spend time in stories over the feed and it is harder to capture someone's click or swipe up technically uh, from a story uh, than it is in a feed. And Facebook is very feed heavy. So I think those are all just things to consider, um, but it really just depends. If you feel like your following is more on Instagram, your customers are more on Instagram, then go that way. And then last question to kind of go hand in hand with that, does IG also have roles? I, I know, I think Facebook owns IG now. Do they yeah. have the same for copy if you're doing a campaign as well? Yeah, so everything that I talked about today um, is uh, ap applicable to Instagram. So everything that you set up in Facebook ads also serves on Instagram. It's all basically one. Um, you, like I said, you could choose to not show on one or the other, but it, if you're only showing on Instagram, you would still set it up in the Facebook ad platform. So everything applies. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Rach, do you have another minute or do you have to bounce? No, I'm good. Okay, cool. So we have one more question. It looks like um, any how to's out there or recommendations on how to become more familiar with Facebook's campaign and ad manager platform. Yeah, so I think that the Loom video that I put together, which is really just a screen recording of me talking through what I'm doing will help a lot because uh, it'll just help you understand where things are. Um, Facebook's, uh, Facebook has like a business help section that can be really helpful because they have like a community um, or like a forum. Um, so going in there and searching some of the questions you have, that can be really helpful as well. And then I know YouTube is full of different things. What I would just make sure to do if you do go to YouTube is make sure that you find like a really recent video because Facebook does change their platform very frequently. Uh, so if you look at a video from two years ago and then try to go into Facebook's platform, it won't look the same at all. Um, so if you do choose to go the YouTube route, just make sure it's as recent as you can find. Um, but also just go in and play around. Uh, so you can go in and you can set up things, you can try things, nothing goes live until you click publish. Uh, so you can do whatever you want and you don't have to worry about it spending money until you tell it to and you actually click publish and it goes live. So don't be afraid to just go in and try things. Yes, totally. There's so many resources out there. It's insane. Mm -hmm. um, 
All right, guys, if no more questions, thank you so much for coming to our fourth mastermind. Um, Rachel, thank you so much. That was seriously so helpful. Um, I hope you guys found it helpful. We are going to have two more masterminds in our six month series. I don't know the exact date for our next one, but it's in January. I believe we're going to be having some social media experts come on and talk about tools that you can use for all different kinds of basically anything social media related, any tools you can use to make your life much easier for posting, creating content, et cetera. So look forward to that. Um, I will be sending invites to you guys. We have a Facebook group um, just for this mastermind where we post the recordings and any resources and information on up, up and coming classes. So look out for that from me on Facebook and I think that's it, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful week. Um, Patty, Michael, I don't know if you guys have any classes coming up that you want to let them know about before we go. No, not, um, not for this month. It's all right. Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, if we don't see you guys or hear from you guys before the new year, have a great Christmas and a happy new year. And thank you again for attending today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.